we just open the assignment up. All right, I'm just gonna open this up real quick just to for the instructions. Okay, so we're gonna be doing diagram practice on many different diagrams and we're going to be doing different types of like ways of looking at diagrams and ways of doing things with diagrams. So really like what I wanted was list all the loads and then list the controls that control those loads. And I know that was a little confusing at first and some people were having problems like is this a load or is this a control? And some parts have load and control built in like a timer. A timer has a timer motor, but then it has timer switches. So the switches of a timer are controlling parts in the machine, but the motor is a load that's advancing the timer through the cycle. So the timer motor would be separate from the timer switches as far as loads and controls. So I'm not gonna write on here, but the, we're gonna go through the diagram and pick them out and then I'll tell you how I would look at it. You know, you guys may look at it the same or you may look at it differently. And then the second part was, was to create like a strip circuit or a ladder diagram like they call it on some manufacturers of each load and what controls it. And then we'll get into the importance or, or how that works and stuff like that. So if we uh, go to here, that's the diagram. Let's first identify the loads um, that are in this machine starting from the top down. What's the first load from the top down? The light bulb. Now, even though it's got a dotted line, the dotted line here means what? Yeah, it may or may not have it. But if the dryer had a light bulb inside of it, this is how the light bulb would be wired in the dryer circuit. Okay? Um, what's the next load? The heater, you said the heater yet? The what? The heater. We're starting from the top down. Oh, so the therm then the thermostat uh, heater. The thermostat heater is thermostat correct. Heater. Oh, yeah. So in the column on the left, what you were supposed to do is start to label every one of those loads. What's the next load down? The motor? Well, there's one above. Does the buzzer count? The buzzer is a load. What does the buzzer do? It makes a signal or noise at the end of the cycle, right? So that is a load. Then what's the next load? The motor. The motor. Okay, any other loads? Oh, no. There has been the button. We got the heater element. Timer motor. Timer motor. The relay coil? The relay coil on the start switch is a load. That is correct. So how many total do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? And if I look at my, my Word document here, I think I left you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven boxes. Now, the thing is in those boxes, depending on how you write it, it could get confusing because some of those parts have more than one path. So what I wanted you to do was identify the controls that control that load. I didn't care at that point if you just labeled all the possible controls that control it or you tried to put them in an order that's saying in this circuit it uses these switches but in the other circuit it uses those. At that point I didn't care. What I wanted you to do at this point was First identify the loads, then identify what in the diagram here is controlling those loads. Why is that important? Why is finding what controls control those loads? So it could be easier to troubleshoot? To that, that, that is the concept of troubleshooting. First, we have to go to the appliance that we're, we're having an issue with. Let's say the dryer, a customer says, oh, it doesn't buzz anymore. The buzzer's not working. Okay, so 
that's the load. If they tell you the dryer's not heating, well, the heating element's probably the load. They tell you the dryer doesn't start. What is the load? The motor. Okay? The push to start switch would be what turns on that load. So that would be the control for that load. So then once you identify the load that is at fault, because the customer's not gonna tell you, hey, my operating thermostat don't work. They don't even know the machine has an operating thermostat or what an operating thermostat is. They're not gonna tell you my door switch don't work. They're gonna tell you the motor don't run. So when they tell you the load doesn't work, in troubleshooting, we have to find the path or the circuit that feeds that load so that we can determine what are we going to test in this machine to find out what's working and what's not working. So the idea was first find the loads, and then if you look, for example, this start switch is two parts. So it has a control and a load built in. The timer motor has timer switches, and they're part of the timer. So you have a load and a control built into the thing, but the timer motor has a specific function. What is the function of a timer motor? Advance. To advance through the cycle, to control how long the cycle runs. And one of the other things about a timer is not to control, not just to control how long it runs and everything, but to also control like when certain parts in a cycle run, like a washing machine. The washer fills with water and then it agitates, then it drains and then it spins. That's the function of the timer. Mm -hmm. Okay, the long silver one. All right, so the key is, is to know what controls are in that circuit to control the load that's not working in the machine. So when we look at it, it's hard sometimes because if I wanted to do the drive motor, okay, just for an example, the drive motor is here, but power has to come in, go through a timer switch, go through a start switch into the motor. We're going to come out the motor here, go through a timer switch here, go back through here, and out to neutral. That is the circuit for the motor. And so once you wrote the motor down as one of the loads that are in the machine, then you had to identify all the controls that control that motor. Yeah. And you can probably put the centrifugal switch if you want it, yeah. but it's part of the motor, so right. it, it is either way. But that is the steps to troubleshoot. That light bulb circuit board you guys did was the first introduction. You guys didn't realize it, but you were looking at the light bulb as a load and the switches that control that load. Okay, so let's, let's go to the assignment here, and I'll go back to page one. And the light bulb was the first load. So what I did is I took the full diagram and I erased everything that we did not need for the light bulb. And then I did every load that way, page by page. So. The, the important thing was, is I wanted you just to draw everything in a straight line. So I cut it out the way it's found inside the machine, but then what I wanted you to do was to draw your own circuit on the extra paper that I gave you, where we just went like this, like this. We went right to the light bulb. I don't know why they drew it like that. And then we had a door switch. I'll put DS, that was it. That's all you had to do for the very first circuit. So if the light bulb didn't work, well, if the machine ran, that meant what? We have power. We have power. And the motor runs off the same voltage light bulb, 120 volts, so we didn't worry about power. So it's, it's either what? It's either a bad light bulb or a bad door switch. But in reverse, if we go up to the machine and we see that that part's not working, we can ohm out the door switch, we can ohm out the light bulb. What other tests could we make? We can ohm out the bulb, we can ohm out the door switch, but what other test could we make to check that circuit? The voltage. Voltage. And where would you where would you check voltage? 
you see that it's, you want to check that it's just going through the whole circuit. You okay, but we're we're on this diagram when I put you my two. You can check it before the bulb. Yeah. You can check it at the bulb, before and after. You can, before and after the right right at the load that's not working. Mm -hmm. If you can get to the load that's not working, it's safe. Like microwave, I don't want you on the high voltage side checking voltage or whatever. But you get to the load and check voltage to that load. If I had voltage there, and my light didn't work. Most likely, what? Light bit bad. Sometimes I've seen refrigerator light bulbs not work, and I changed the bulb, and the new bulb didn't work. So I went and I checked voltage. I had voltage. That those plastic sockets, sometimes when you screw a bulb in, it gets tight before it screws all the way in. Or in a, in a, in a light socket, the outside where the screw screws in is one part of the bulb. So when you got a light bulb like this, The threaded part is where one of these wires would go, most likely the neutral side. But the other part is touching the very center or bottom of that light bulb. And inside of here, it goes like this and goes to the outside. And that's how power is applied to that bulb. But I've seen inside the socket, like here where it's threaded, on the very bottom, there's a piece of metal that's like spring loaded. So when you screw down, this piece has to touch that. And I've seen sometimes people had the wrong bulb in there and they screwed it all the way down so they bent that piece down. So when you try to change the bulb, the next one never touched the metal. And all you had to do was like bend it up just a little bit so it could make contact to the bulb. But still, if I had voltage at this point, that means my circuit's good, the problem's at the bulb. Whether it's the bulb or the socket or whatever, once I have voltage to my load, I'm not worried about anything else but that point. And so this exercise here was to help you sort of see the controls that all control that, as well as the circuit and how we would troubleshoot that out. Any questions on this one? This one was pretty simple. We get a little more complicated as we go. No? Let's go to the next diagram. That's the thermostat heater. Now, let me just bring up a quick picture real quick. This one right here is good. We'll go here. Copy. And let's go here. No. Nope. Didn't I just copy that? I thought I copied the, the light bulb there. Let's see what happened. Let's go here and I'll try to copy it from here. For some reason I didn't want to copy the image. So copy. And okay, so this is a dryer thermostat. Yeah. But we're talking about the thermostat heater. Is it there? Is the thermostat heater here or is it somewhere else in the machine? It's not is it, that doesn't say thermostat heater right there on the diagram? It's here, but here. Is it here? No. It's these two terminals right here. In here is a switch from these two terminals. That is a switch that's controlling the heater. But these two smaller terminals are called a thermostat heater. Now I've talked about that in a couple of my other videos and lectures. That's to trick the thermostat. Back in the day, most of you young guys weren't even around at the time. When I started working on dryers, they had three thermostats in the back of the dryer. One for low heat, one for medium heat, and high heat. So depending on what temperature the customer chose, they'd send power through that thermostat, and when it opened, it turned the heater off at 120 or 130 or 140, 160. Those temperatures, those are the average range of heat. But they said, hey, we could reduce it to one thermostat and get it to do multiple heats. 
So without that thermostat heater, most thermostats look just like that with two prongs for the connect two wires. And we'll get to that circuit in a little bit. But that thermostat heater, they put a little tiny heater. If you break it open, an old one, you'll see like a little tiny piece in there. It looks like a resistor that gets warm. And if I put voltage from here to here, it heats up inside the thermostat because what opens that thermostat is the hot air that flows underneath it. When it gets hot enough, a piece inside, what we call a bimetal, opens a switch. But that thermostat usually has a rating of, let's say, L155. L is the limit, and 155 is the temperature at which that thermostat opens. That'd be high heat. It could be 160, it could be 140, 145, 155. But well, I'll just say L155. So without this thermostat heater, the air flowing underneath it like this has to be 155 degrees and that switch will open shutting the heater off. Thermostat heater is not used on high heat. A lot of people would think, well, once you turn the heater on, thermostat heater on, wouldn't that add more heat? No, it doesn't add heat to the air that goes over our clothes. It adds heat to actually inside this thermostat. So if I look right here, how much voltage am I sending to my thermostat heater? 120. 120 volts. So I'm applying line one here and neutral here, 120 volts, and it's heating up inside that thermostat. Okay? So when I heat up inside that thermostat, it's going to trick the thermostat. Instead of the air at 155, I'll have the air at 120, and that'll open that same switch because the heat that's added to this would trick the thermostat thinking the air outside's 155. So by using the same thermostat, we could trick it to open at a lower temperature, and we can get low heat and high heat. Okay, so how do we do that? What is this switch right here, C to H? That's a timer switch. That's found inside of our timer. Normally, when you guys draw it, in your drawing, I would like you to draw it like most dryers or, or washers. A timer switch is usually drawn thicker or more bold. So when you look at it, it doesn't look like the door switch. You could just look real quick and see a bold switch and it would be more identifiable without even have to look at the terminals and the markings and everything like that is what it's doing. So we got a timer switch here that controls that heater and we have a door switch that controls the heater. So we only have two controls controlling this heater and that is only energized for low heat. Did anybody, did you guys have that circuit? Did you have the second circuit for the thermostat heater? Well, I did, well it takes the path of least resistance, so why, why do you need the second one? The second one that goes through the guard switch into the... No, I'll, I'll show you in a second. Let me just copy it this. Goes through T, the one that goes through T2? Uh, I'll show you in one second. I have to see the diagram. Give me one second. Let's go to this diagram because now... We set through a temperature selector switch. Now, what changed here? What changed the very first switch that comes in? Did something change there? It was? Yeah, you guys were both talking at the same time. What? C to B. It, it was C to B before? C to H before. C to H. C to H. And that is C to B. So if we go here. Before, we were running through here to the thermostat. Now we're running from here, right, to the thermostat heater. But like, like Josh said, though, is that if this switch is closed, that's the path of least resistance. Current's not going to flow through there. So what's going to determine current going through here? What's going to make it go through the selector switch? instead of just go straight to the heater like we showed in the first circuit. What's, what's going to change that makes it go through that selector switch? One of you raise your hand, you're all talking, I didn't know. One of you raise your hand, got an answer. Anybody got an answer? Yes. 
Yeah, but specifically what? C to B. Not C to B. Listen, C to B also controls what? Our motor, right? So C to B always closes. So that has nothing to do with it. It's not that a switch closes. It's C to H is open. So if you've got a timer circuit like time drive, time drive will normally be high heat. So we'll never close C to H. And if a customer selects a medium or low heat, well then it's gonna give you a low heat or medium heat, depending on what the selector switches say. But if you put the timer in a permanent press cycle or a delicate cycle, let's say delicate, it's gonna force 120 volts there whether a customer wants it or not, so that we get low heat because the cycle is dependent on it. But in time dry, the temperature selector allows the customer to choose. So if I send power here instead of power here, aren't I still sending power to the th same thermostat heater? So am I getting a different heat or am I just getting low heat by going through here? Low heat by going through a longer well, path? Yes and no. Inside this selector switch, not even inside, um, Whirlpool puts a resistor on this switch. And not only that though, if you've ever seen the dryer, you look at the plug that plugs into the back of the selector switch and the resistor is actually external where you can see it on the quick disconnect of the timer, uh, I mean of the temperature selector switch. You can see the resistor. So what does a resistor do? I'm forcing it through here. If I put it on high heat, it's still not gonna let any power go in. If I put it on low heat, it's gonna let power go through here and put 120 volts here. But what would happen if I forced it through a resistor that was attached to it? So in other words, there's two switches here. One switch, it goes like this and send power directly around or this one's open and then I send power here. So I had two options, whether I went right there and put 120 there, but if I go through a resistor, what happens when that resistor's in series with that heater? What happens when you put two loads in series? You get, you, get a voltage you get a voltage drop. So the voltage here is no longer 120 if I force it through the resistor. So for easy terms, I only put 60 volts here instead of 120. So I put 60 volts, I'm only gonna get half the heat. So instead of 120 here, I put 60. The heater in here is getting half the power. It's only gonna get half as hot. So instead of giving it full power, with it off, we had 155. With it 120 volts, we had 120. But with 60 volts, I get somewhere about 135, 140. So I can get a medium heat if I put a lower voltage there. So by forcing the voltage around through here, I can get a medium heat. Now, I'm going to tell you what, most customers won't even notice low, medium, and high unless they put delicate clothing in and it's set on high, it's going to damage the clothing. So you as a tech have to troubleshoot that. Give me some things that would cause that type of problem. A customer calls you out and says, hey, look, I dry my towels and my jeans and everything and they're drying Beautifully, I don't have a problem with that. I put it on the delicate cycle, and I had, you know, my evening wear, like ladies' evening wear or something like that. I don't want to put it on high heat because the heat will damage it. But when I took it out, they were all shrunk and, and like overheated, like I threw it in the oven. So how do, you, how do you troubleshoot something like that? First of all, you had to know what the function of that little thermostat heater was to give me low heat. So how, how do we approach that as a possible problem? You go straight to it, no? You go straight to what? The thermostat heater. 
So you go straight to the thermostat heater, and then what am I doing with that thermostat heater? Checking the ohm, ohm it out. Okay. We always want to go to ohm second if we can. Voltage is our troubleshooting. Because I want to know if I got power there. If I got power there, then I'll ohm it out to confirm it. But we don't want to go ohms because you get a resistance value there. You don't know if you're getting electricity there to even make it work. So I want if I got power there. If I know if I got power there, by checking voltage right to here, if I have any voltage at all, I've already eliminated all of my controls, where I have three different controls controlling it in that circuit. But the other thing was, going back to the previous circuit, is what cycle did the customer put the machine on? Did they have it on time dry? Did they have it on a low heat or a medium heat or a high heat selection? Customer may have selected the wrong cycle. So you'd have to say, hey, ma'am, could you show me what cycle you, you, you used on that machine so that you're going to troubleshoot that cycle and see what's causing it. And if you're not getting low heat, well, I need to know if I have voltage there. If I have voltage there, that tells me everything in this circuit's good. And door switch, if the door switch was bad, what would happen? The motor wouldn't even run, right? That timer switch is the only thing that controls power to that heater in delicate. But if we went to permanent press, now we use a different timer switch and selector switch. We're still using the same door switch, right? Mm -hmm. But now we got two things, right? Well, not really because C to B, and we'll look at it in another circuit, that controls the motor. So if C to B is bad, the motor won't even run. So look at what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, well, I, even though the door switch is part of that circuit, well, if I go to the motor circuit, um, let's say the motor circuit here, the motor circuit uses that same door switch. Mm -hmm. It uses same C to B as that temperature selector, which was right there. I removed it so we could just see that circuit. So if the motor is running, I don't even have to test those two components. So you see with, with troubleshooting, it's not always, oh, look for the circuit that's not working and, and just start probing. Because now what we wanna do is look at other components that use the same control. And if another component that uses that door switch is working, but the thermostat heater, which was here, is not working, well, if the motor's running, I'm not worried about that. If the motor's running, I'm not worried about this timer switch. Now I can begin my troubleshooting. So what do we do? We identified what the failure was that the customer told us. We identified what load in the circuit would cause that failure. We looked at that circuit, and this is going to be redrawn. I'll come back to this in a minute. I'm going to go back to the others. We look at the drawing of that circuit, and we say, well, this door switch is used on many components. And if the motor's running, it's not my door switch, so I don't have to test it. Now I've reduced the amount of things I have to check. Now I can go into the machine. Now I can start making my test. Okay, the hardest part about troubleshooting, a lot of people say, I can't read the diagram. Okay, I understand. That is gonna come in time and in practice, which is what we're doing. But we also have to know the parts of the machine. We have to know what that thermostat heater does if it's a heating problem. What if I saw a timer, a thermostat like this? And I didn't want to get off track on that thermostat, but just the fact that we're talking about thermostats. if I can find one. So we have different types of thermostats. I can find the one that I want to show you. Oh, right here. This one right here. Look at this one. How many terminals does that thermostat right here have? Three. Three. Why do we have three? 
Single pole, double throw. That remember the drawing I had had a connection between these two. Well, that type of thermostat, that type of thermostat has the extra pin. So instead of a single pole double throw switch like this, where this pin is this one and this pin is that one, we have a single pole double throw switch where one's closed and the other one's open. So we have two outlets. If you see a thermostat like that, it don't have the thermostat heater inside of it. Another name for that thermostat heater is called a bias heater. Because back in the day, a bias heater, let me show you what that looks like, just in case you happen to see one like that. I think Frigidaire still has some of these in use. If I can find the uh, part here. I think it's Frigidaire has it. And I don't even see it. This one has the thermostat heater inside of it. The bias heater. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to find it because there's very few companies that use it. But let, let's go back to my drawing just so I could show you. I think that's it's in our dryer book. Let me go ahead and open up that book real quick. I think dryer one is here. I think it has a picture of it here. if it has it in here still. There it is. Here they call it a thermostat heater too, but I think if I scroll down a little bit, they call it a bias heater. Okay, thermostat heater, bias heater, same thing. But when they first came out with this, it was, oops, I went too far, sorry. When they first came out with it, it was external. The thermostat sat on top of it and the two screws that screwed the thermostat down went through these openings so the, the part that sensed the temperature of the air in the thermostat was engulfed in that. And here were the two small terminals. So instead of the thermostat having four terminals like the one I showed you, you had these two on the side. And I think Frigidaire still uses this. So that is the heater that tricks the thermostat. So if I wanted low heat, and here's the temperature selector switch. If I close AH1, it goes through here. HT means high temperature, terminal one, high temperature, terminal three. It's a high temperature thermostat. HS is high safety. But a thermostat heater, if I don't open this one, I, I close this one and this one. I close them both. I'm still going through here to feed the heater but I turn this, this on, which that thermostat's sitting on top, now I'm tricking that thermostat. But in this case, I only have low and high heat, right? Or do I have multiple temperatures like the other one? Looking at this circuit, do I have, do I have low, medium, and high, or do I have four temperatures, or I have two, or I have one? What, what do we have on here? <coughs> How many is that here? Two. Two only, very good, that's correct. Mm -hmm. That if I don't turn on the heater, I get high heat. But if I send power to the heater, I only get low heat, but I can't change the voltage to the heater. The heater gets 120 to neutral, or it don't get voltage at all. So I only have low heat and high heat. I got two different options. Okay, so that's, that's it, there's only two. Now, if I can control the voltage, like add another switch, put a resistor in series with it, then I can get a medium heat. But that's how that bias heater works and that thermostat works. So, any questions so far? Now, this one we don't have to redraw because it's pretty much a straight shot, but some of these other circuits I'm going to redraw in the way the circuit is set up, okay? 
So that's the thermostat heater. We've already gone over that. So here we have what? To push to start relay coil. Now I talked a little bit about this when we talked about the dryer troubleshooting, but let's just take this and let me just do it in a straight shot where line one comes in and it goes C to B. So you got a switch here. You make it bold to put C to B. And then from here, we got the push to start switch. And then we have the relay coil. And then we have the door switch. And neutral. If that part was to fail, what would the machine do if this coil failed? What's the purpose of that coil, first of all? To be the relay, the, the start relay for the for when the motor's starting, isn't it? Yeah, but what what's physically happening? So the motor won't start. It'll boost it. Not not that the motor won't start. Or it'll 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 turn off as soon as you let go of the button. So or if it failed, it. see this switch provides power to that. That that's a coil. When we give a coil power, what happens to it? It's magnetic, right? So when I press it down, if I complete this circuit, this coil will close and it'll hold that switch down. Now it's not drawing a straight line here because what's on this other circuit is your main motor, right? So if the coil fails, like he said, if the coil fails, I'll press start, power will go through here and the motor, the motor will run, but when I let go, if the coil's no good, what would happen? The motor would stop running. Now here's a thing you need to pay attention. Because right now I said, if that relay coil's bad, the dry will run when I'm holding the button down, when I let go, it dies. Now when I first started working on appliances, we're gonna go all the way back to 1983. They used push to start relays. Yeah. Those of you shaking your head were just born or not born yet, that's why. But back then, they were all pushed to start relays. So if you pushed it in and the dryer ran while you were holding it and you let go, I ordered a start switch because I knew it ran when I held it down, but it didn't stay running. I knew that switch wasn't, but they changed it to the newer switch, the momentary contact switch, not this one. And a lot of guys would go there and push it down. I've had customers that had a brick leaning up against the start switch so the dryer would continue to run. But that was a relay coil. That the new dryers, the switch is only closed when you hold it down. When you let go, that switch opens. The centrifugal switch in the motor is what keeps it running. So they changed that circuit. And when they changed the design of that circuit, a lot of the old timer techs, Remember, when I went to work there, there was a lot of older guys there that had been working 10, 20 years for Sears. So they all knew the older style, and then they came out with this newer one. They were ordering a push-to-start switch. They put the new push-to-start switch in, and the same problem happened. And it was the centrifugal. Now, that, no, that, that, well, if it was a push-to-start switch problem, it was probably a bad centrifugal switch. You are correct there in, in that analysis. So if I went to this machine and I pressed start and the coil was bad, the dryer wouldn't stay running. Let's just say this is a push to start relay. We looked at the diagram, we know this is the type of switch we have. I'm not trying to trick you and, and do the other one right now. So what do we do? What do we test? Both. What? We test Both. the coil. We don't test anything. We just change that switch. Change. Well, you're like, well, wait a minute. C to B, if it's bad, it's not going to work. Um, D to S, if it's bad, it's not work. But if I press start and the motor runs, the motor is using the same door switch and the same C to B. And when you pressed it down, the motor ran, so you know the contact of the switch is good. What's the only thing left? The coil. So that's why the old timers back in the day, they'd press start and they'd see the motor running, but the dryer didn't continue to run when they let go. They would just order that switch because there was nothing left in this circuit because if the motor ran, all the other switches that had to do that that same circuit was good. 
And I had a guy call me the other day, and we, we talked a little bit about this, where he had a dryer that this same exact diagram that he pressed start, and the unit would run. No, the unit wasn't running. The dryer motor wouldn't run at all. So if the dryer didn't want to run, it could be a timer switch, it could be a door switch, it could be the motor, it could be even the start switch here. So I started off with testing the motor. We'll get to the motor circuit because there's even more switches in there that's not drawn here. And, and then I thought about it and I said, no, wait a minute. If I close this and these things are working, this coil would hold that switch closed. I said, do me a favor, just touch the side of the start <coughs> switch. Do you feel it vibrating or getting warm? Because if vibrating and getting warm, I know that that coil is holding the switch down. And he said, no, I don't feel it. And so I had him check power, which was actually here and here, and he didn't have power here. I stopped troubleshooting the motor circuit. I started troubleshooting the start switch. Why? Why did I go from the motor wasn't running, so why am I checking the motor circuit? Why don't I just go to this circuit? Because it's before you get to the motor. Well, this thermal fuse would stop the motor from running, right? But if we look at this circuit here for the coil, I think, you know what I think I have, I can draw on it on, on the other software. So let's go back to the other screen. Were, weren't you just saying that you asked the customer if the what was vibrating? If, if you yes. could actually feel the start switch. Like vibrating. Like, like if the coil was holding that switch right. closed once you pressed it so down. So then you asked why don't you go to the thermal switch no, no. That was your question? No, no. Uh, why, I was did you like, start, why did you no. move that to the start switch? Uh, I'll, 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 I'll rephrase it. I go to the customer's house. You press start. The dryer wasn't running. The guy had voltages at the outlet. He told me he had 120, 120, 240, right? Mm -hmm. So I was concerned. Well, when I press start, I want to see the motor run. So in my head, I'm doing this. I'm looking at this circuit right here. For the motor that's the circuit for the motor so i said look uh, he's on the back of the machine he couldn't get to the motor he had to take the drum out and everything so i'm trying to get as close to the motor as i possibly can which would have been the thermal fuse here and this timer switch right here and both of them are easily accessible from the back the thermal fuse is down in the bottom timers right there tell them if you got voltage but you have to press the start button to tell me you got voltage. And he said, no, I don't got voltage. And so then I'm like, okay, well, do we have a problem on the neutral side? Do we have a problem on the line one side and everything? So I was like, okay, let's move this one over here and see how I got voltage here. Because I have voltage here and don't have voltage there. And then my fuse is not letting it. But if this is bad and I move this one over here and I have voltage here and not there, and then the timer switch is bad. And so I was going all different directions trying to find out where the voltage was. And then I'm looking at it and I'm saying, wait a minute, forget about that. Let's, let's do something a little bit easier. I told him, go to this terminal and this terminal. Do you have 120 there? Because this motor and this coil use a lot of the same components, not all of them. But if I have voltage here and my motor don't work, okay, so now the problem is one of these three. If I don't have voltage here, I don't care about them. I need to, what's highlighted now is where I need to look for the problem. So you see how I'm using different parts of the circuit to troubleshoot other things out. And the guy didn't have 120 here. So I have 120 here. I don't care about the motor and the timer switch and the thermal <laughs> fuse. I started off that way until I looked and saw the coil would be an easier way to troubleshoot that problem out. Okay, so after I did that and he didn't have the voltage, the next thing I said is do me a favor, take this meter lead and go right to the back of the machine where the power cord is and go to neutral. Do you have power here? And he pressed start and he says, yeah, Richard, I have 120 volts. So what does that mean? What does that mean? He's got one meter lead here, 
<coughs> and one meter lead here, we have 120. When this meter lead and this meter lead are here, he has zero volts. Yeah. What the, what what is that? Those two tests telling me? The I'm sorry. The no, because here and here says zero volts. How does that mean the coil's bad? I need voltage here for the coil to work. Now, every time I made that test, I had to press the start button at this point. Sorry guys, I heard a noise in the shop. I didn't know what's going on. So. But if I don't have voltage here, that coil is not going to work. Point, so. But I have voltage here. So what that means is if I don't have it here, but I have it here, I lost it from here to here. I have it here, and then I went here, I don't have it. I lost it on the neutral side. So two tests told me my problem's there. I said, hey man, your problem's a door switch. Mm -hmm. It could be a wire between those two points. Your problem's a door switch. He said, okay, Rich, you know, I, I, I'll check it out and get back to you. He lifted up the top. He didn't even see the door switch in the machine. <laughs> It seemed like such a simple circuit. When you look at the whole diagram, it's complicated. But if you're able to break down just that circuit, it eliminates a lot of the things you have to test. Because a lot of people walk up to some of these machines and they got so many parts and so many wires, they look at it like, I don't know where to begin or what to do. But these strip circuits I'm having you do is the same way that you trace out that circuit or whatever. When I look at a whole diagram and I find out what load is not working, give me the problem, in my head I can, I can trace that whole circuit. And I can say, well, this, let me see, I got voltage here. If I have voltage here, okay, my problem's this way. If I don't have voltage here, I'm just gonna troubleshoot this circuit. And I only have a timer switch, a door switch, or possibly that start switch. Those are the only three things that would not let power get to that coil. But that's how we break down. That's, that's how our thought process has to be when we're troubleshooting electrical circuits. Now, sometimes it's a little more complicated when we get into these appliances that have a circuit board controlling components. Because sometimes a sensor and a refrigerator is telling the board not to turn another part on. So you've got a compressor not running, and here you are troubleshooting the compressor not running. So I'm not getting voltage, the board's not sending voltage, but a sensor's bad telling the refrigerator it's cold when it's not. It's a little more difficult when we get into that, but then again, I know what a sensor does, and I know how to check a sensor, and I know if a sensor's bad, it won't let certain parts run. Any questions about this so far? No? You guys are so good. Hopefully when I give you more assignments like this, you guys will. So here is our motor circuit. And I already gave away some of the information. How many controls do we have on this motor circuit? Number of controls? Six. Six, we got one, two, three, four, five. If you want to say that switch, you could say six. Okay. Your dryer doesn't run. Like this call that we just talked about. Your dryer don't run. The motor sometimes even though I say when you're troubleshooting a circuit, we want to go to voltage, make sure that always voltage to the machine first. Right. We have proper voltage, now we're going inside the machine. Almost never would you want to go right to the drive motor. Why? Physically hard to get to. The physical things you have to do just to get down to that motor, and there's not many other parts in the diagram or circuit of the machine you can test once you've determine whether you got power there or not. So that's why going back to the problem we had previously where the guy called me and said the motor wasn't working, 
I wanted to get as close to the motor as possible, but on the back of the machine, I have the thermal fuse, I have the start switch, I have a timer switch, and another timer switch all on the back of the machine. And even the door switches, even though it's not in the back of the machine, it's underneath the top. One test from here to here, I can all mount that door switch. I use the neutral on the back of the machine, the, the, the thing where you got the three screws, line one, neutral, line two. And this is where this is going here. So I just go to T2 and this one. Can I ohm out the door switch from there? So where do I put my meter for voltage testing on this machine? L1 and L2. Not L1, L2. We, we've determined that we have proper power. Oh, okay. So where on the machine, like I said, is we want to get as close to the motor as possible without actually having to get down to the motor. I said it earlier, what two terminals are we going to go to that can get us as close as we can from the back of the machine? T2. T2. And neutral. No, here. Because this is line one. This is the neutral side of the motor. This is where I wanted the strip circuits that you guys drew to be drawn. Because if I was to draw this motor circuit, I'm going to move this down just so I got room up here to draw. I'm going to just do a simple L1 goes to a timer switch, C to B. It goes to the push to start switch. Here. From there, I got a thermal fuse. And then it goes right into 4M on the motor. Centrifugal switch. And then coming out the motor, I have another timer switch, S to T. And then what? Door switch, DS, and neutral. That right there is this circuit straightened out. So if I'm putting my meter lead on here and here, I'm actually on, actually I should have been on S, not T. S, not T. Yes, I should be on S, not T. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna go S and here and see if I have 120 volts. If I have 120 volts right here, what do I do? What do I do next? Do I make it on and the motor's not running? The motor's not running. Well, change the motor or check the, the motor. The problem's at the motor. Now, all the guys are going to tell you, and this is important, Josh, for the competition, is if you did a test like this, they don't want you to just say, Oh, it's a bad motor without going down to the motor and proving voltage there. Now we're going to take it apart and prove it. Because in the competition, a technician before you who troubleshot the machine forgot to plug in the motor and the judge didn't catch it. It's a judge responsibility to make sure that the contestant before you put the machine back together. And we had that happen. One of my guys was in a contest. And one of the plugs were off the board on the stove and the, the control board wasn't working. And he told the judge, well, this is why the control board's not working. The plug was off. The judge says, oh, okay. But the guy before him left the plug off. If you see a plug loose, that is not a problem in the contest. That is the guy before you left it and they're supposed to fix the problem and have you start all over again. So I want you to pay attention to that. That, happened, that happened like twice. Okay. Twice. But they're supposed to give you time and and you know, make sure that, that you point it out immediately when you identify it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to start all over from scratch again. But going back to our troubleshooting here, if I have voltage here and here, what I'm testing, and a lot of people think, well, if I'm testing here and here, I'm checking the motor. I'm not checking the motor. I'm checking to see if this has got voltage coming to here, and I'm checking to see if the neutral is to here. Now, at that one point, if I have voltage, I've eliminated timer switch, start switch, thermal fuse, and timer switch and door switch with one voltage test. I determine all those switches are good. Not what is bad, but what is good. Because if one of those parts were bad, I wouldn't have voltage at that point. So when we're troubleshooting with voltage, we're not checking a specific part. We're checking a circuit to see if everything in that circuit is allowing voltage up to that point. Does that make sense? This is troubleshooting.
okay? Now, if I had voltage here, the next thing I wanna do is go four and five on the motor and see if I got voltage here, because lo and behold, I got a broken wire, I'm not gonna have voltage here. And I know technicians who go out there and say, oh, I have voltage here, it's, the only thing left is the motor, I'm gonna order a motor. So you know what happens? You're the technician who's going back to put the motor in, but you didn't diagnose it. So you go there, you take the whole machine apart, you had to fight to get the blower wheel off, and you finally got the motor in, put the whole machine back together, and you press start, and the dryer doesn't run. I learned that very early on. If I didn't diagnose it, I'm not going to change the transmission or a motor or anything else like that until I determine that that person prior to me diagnosed it right. I don't care if it's someone who had the experience I have. I'm not gonna go through all that labor putting the motor on and finding out that's not my problem. I see you smiling how many times you go and do a job that someone said it's a bad compressor and you go put a compressor, do the whole sealed system job and it wasn't that bad evaporator fan. It happens. So before you change that compressor, what do you do? Take a minute and check to make sure that they diagnosed it right because you, a compressor job's an hour, two hour long job. You don't want to go through all that. And a lot of times what guys do is that they, they just want to go home. Oh yeah. And they say, oh, it's a compressor, oh, yeah, a compressor, and the next guy gets it. <laughs> and, and I got guys up north that they get paid hourly and we don't really pay overtime, but if they finish at two o'clock, they get paid for eight hours. So they rush through it. And a couple of them aren't sealed system guys. Now they're supposed to call me before we say it's a compressor or, or restriction or whatever. They just say, oh, it needs a compressor. Well, guess what? They're not the one that goes back and do it because they don't do compressor changes. So before you go and change parts, you're working for a company and someone else diagnoses before you. Unless you're 100% confident who you're running behind, Take five minutes or two minutes and double check. And only a couple of meter tests can prove if I told you this timer switch is bad and you're changing the timer, could you just take a minute and ohm it out and confirm it? Because nothing's worse than having to take it apart, changing the part, and then you put it back together again to try it and it doesn't work. So what do you do? Now you gotta take it back apart, panels back apart, and then you gotta do the troubleshooting that this person was supposed to do. Now, everybody makes mistakes. I make mistakes, make them a lot. And as I get older, I make more mistakes than ever. But you always check for yourself. Unless it's your company, you're the one that ordered it, you don't want to do the work. So voltage testing here and here is going to check the circuit too. And that one voltage test at that point, if I have 120, tells me all of those parts are good. The problem has to be down at the motor. I'm going to check four and five, and if I have 120 here, I change the motor. That's it. But what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to draw that straight circuit. I, I've seen this over the years that when people are drawing circuits or diagrams for practice, they'll go like this, and then they'll do a timer switch, and then they'll do a thermal fuse. And I'm not picking anybody out, so if you think I'm talking about you, I'm not. But I've seen this over the years. And... You, you don't see a path, you don't see a connection. It's a little confusing if I don't connect the dots. You know, it makes more sense that way. So I want you to practice these. This is, the more you practice this, the easier it is when you look at it, you can understand the flow, you can understand the components and the testing of it. Any questions so far? No? So that's the motor circuit. And that's what I wanted you to draw. I did not separate the circuit with the, with, the, with the centrifugal switch in the running position and all that. Some people might have done that, but that's really not needed to keep the motor running. That completes the circuit for the buzzer, and we'll get to that in the next couple circuits here. So we got the timer motor. Timer motor has two possible circuits. In this case, this is time dry. In time dry, the timer switch is closed T to X. In automatic dry, it's closed T to F. So right now, I showed just the time dry for the timer motor. How many controls are in series with that timer motor? There's two. 
C to B and T to X. Customers complaint would be what if this load was not working? What would they call they would call you and tell you this is happening. What would they say? Taking too long to dry. Not too long to dry because the head dryer timer motor is not working. If the timer motor don't work, what's the complaint gonna be? Never shuts off. Timer don't advance. But the timer motor's bad. But when you rotate the dial by hand, you're already opening and closing these timer switches. Okay? So, what would we do? <coughs> we set it to time dry, and then what? Take voltage to the actual time. Voltage to actual time? If I have zero volts here, you would test the switch. Why? Because there's no current. Well, what switch do you want me to check? The C to B. Really? C to B also sends power to my motor. I'm telling you, the dryer doesn't end the cycle. So is C to B good? C to B is good because my motor is running, right? Yeah. And I did say the dryer is running, it just don't shut off. So I don't have to check C to B. Because that same switch down here is controlling my timer motor. If we go back to this here, C to B was going to our drive motor here. If the drive motor is running, I don't need to check that switch. And there's only one other switch is this one, but where is this switch and this switch found on the machine? Inside the timer. So if either one of those switches are bad, I'm just changing the timer. That's it. If the machine's running, I know C to B is good. This timer switch could be defective, but it doesn't matter if it's defective, I'm gonna change the timer. If that motor's bad, Change the timer. If I got 120 there or not, change the timer. There's nothing else it could be. There's no thermal fuse or door switch or anything outside of the timer that sends power to that motor. So I wouldn't check them. But you see breaking down the circuit and drawing these circuits out, again, I don't have to worry about the door switch because it's not part of this circuit. I don't have to worry about the thermal fuse. I don't have to worry about the start switch. Okay, so timed automatic dry. Something happens here. In timed automatic dry, the power goes here. What kind of complaint would be if T to F was back? The what? The heating. Well, no, that's not the heater circuit, because if we go to here, this one, and I'll clear it out. In time dry, power went through the timer here. And this is why I tried to draw them in straight circuits instead of trying to draw that line. Now, I think one of the things that made me really good about diagrams was as a kid, you know, we grew up without computers. We grew up without cell phones. I didn't have cable TV till I was like in junior high, high school. I remember MTV coming out and everything. But I did a lot of word searches, like the ones with all the scrambled letters and you had to search words. And I did a lot of maze books with starts to finish. I got to the point where I was drawing mazes like real small lines on a whole sheet of paper for my friends to do. But following those mazes and trying to get as fast and as good as I can, it's almost like what we're doing here, right? The diagram's like a maze and you're just trying to find a path for that one specific component. So if you got maze books and practice maze books, they'll help your eyes focus on the path if, if you don't do it. But that's how I used, that's how I looked at a diagram as a maze. But that was time dry. In automatic dry, and I'll use uh, my marker instead, the automatic dry 
was here. Okay. You what? Like, how do you know what's timed and automatic? And... Well, I don't want to move this right now, but there's a timer chart I showed you that showed you in what cycle the customer selected, what contacts in the timer switch were closed. It's at the top of the page. That right here on the top of the page that I put timed or automatic. If we looked at, at let me just, let me just, uh, let's see. I can move this and bring it back. Oh no, I only have the, the, the one part of the diagram cut out. Here we go. So if we look here, this one right here tells me in auto T to F and timed T to X. Now if we go to the diagram, T to X and timed and T to F and auto. That's how we know which way the pattern is. Okay. So let's go back to this. Now we're having a problem in auto dry. <clears throat> Timer's not running in auto dry, but timer is running in timed dry. The black line that I drew is showing you how electricity is traveling in time dry. The yellow one is showing you how electricity is traveling in auto dry. So again, if I had a customer say, well, on time drive, I put it on, and then 30 minutes later, I put it on 30, it's off. In auto drive, I put it on, that thing's running all day. So, hmm, let me think. If time's working, then everything in the time circuit has to be good, right? Because I told you time's working, right? So I'm going to erase everything that had that black line drawn through it. I'm going to remove this. And the black line here, like this, because I know time's worked. The pen is good. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So now what's left in yellow is my only possible problem. Because everything I just erased, I know is good because I've seen the timer work. I know the timer's working in time. So I erased the time drawing. That's what's left in yellow is what's left of the of the auto that follows a different path than timed. Back here. Timed and auto share the same path. So if time's working, I'm not worrying about these components. I'm only worrying about what is different from the circuit that works and the circuit that don't work. And that leaves me only three possible things, and what are they? Timer switch. Timer switch, what? T and F. Okay, so whenever I ask questions like that, like where on the board would you test or, or where on the diagram, Try to be specific to the points. Imagine, I don't know what you're talking about, and you say timer switch TF, or the plug on the board P1 to P4, or be specific in your points, because that's what you're gonna do on the machine. What else? 30 grams. What? 30 grams. If the heat number's bad, it won't advance, will it? And then what else? Has to come to the centrifugal. centrifugal switch. So, what more tests can I do before I put a meter on this thing? To see if it's getting hot, right? Mm -hmm. I put an auto dry and I can see if the heater's working. I can open up the drum, I can go behind the back and see if hot air is coming out. If hot air is coming out, what does that mean about my heater? What does that mean about my centrifugal switch? Oh, so then let's go ahead and erase those. Now, what do I have left? Timer switch. What do I do? Change time. So if I saw that the auto dry worked, that didn't work. In this case, the only thing left is that timer switch. So if the heater works, it can't be the heater. Yes. So going back to something that you said about like when you're out doing a job and you order a part. So if, if you're out doing a job and you order a part, you still have an opportunity of not being that person that goes back out to that job to put Depending in the on the size of the company, yes. Usually a company likes to send the same technician back. 
especially if they're commission based or other things. But if I got hourly based employees, and what if that employee's on vacation for a week? I can't have the customer wait a week till he comes back. I'm gonna have to have someone else do the job. Okay, and in some cases, I have technicians that work a specific area, and then other days I have them in a totally different area. So your best practice is if that's you, you go and do your own your own diagnostic before anyone. Yes, and in my company, I have shelves that are broken down per technician. So when parts are ordered and the parts people receive it, they put it on the shelf for the technician that ordered the part. Many reasons why. One of the reasons is that when we get a route for a technician the next day, the paper we print gives the parts person every call that that technician's running for that day and a list for the first two jobs, they're fresh jobs. Nobody's ever been out, but the third job, someone ordered a motor and a timer. So that parts person has to go to the shelf of that tech and pull the part. Now, if he puts it in the same text bin or another text bin, that's dependent on that. But he would look at the ticket, see who ordered the part, then he would pull it off the shelf and put it in the bin. Okay, now auto dry, how does auto dry work? Because we need to understand just a little bit more about this circuit and this cycle. Why? Why these two different circuits here, where time goes up to TX, but this goes TF, what, what's the difference? Time dry is on a timer and auto dry is on a sensor. Something like that. Auto dry, now we can get it, there's many auto dry cycles. Some have these two metal bands and every time the wet clothes hit, but those are electronic. Back in the 70s and 80s, well, they had a mechanical timer, but then they had a little tiny board for auto dry. And they had these two metal bands in the drum. Every time the wet clothes hit the two bands, the moisture in the clothes allowed a small, low voltage current go between the two bands. One band went up to the circuit board, the other band went right to ground. And whenever wet clothes hit it, and a little low voltage went to ground, the board saw it, the board delayed the timer, like slow, hey, slow down, we're, we're, we're not close to drying yet, I keep having wet clothes. And that, that was the idea, was to make sure that the clothes were dry before the machine shut off. That's what auto dry is, because auto dry doesn't have 20 minute, 30 minute, 40 minute, it didn't have time, it was auto dry. So the thing was though, is that if the dryer was tilted back and the sensors were in the front, the clothes never hit it, the dryer shut off before they dry. People use those little, uh, tear off bounce or bounty whatever those fabric softeners are they were like oily and they would actually put an oily finish on there so sometimes the moisture didn't actually make contact to the metal because they needed to be cleaned mm -hmm. so there were many different things but this one didn't work that way the way this one works is that when we went this way for power when the heater was on from this point to this point where the timer motor meet here and here at the same point that this circuit is, when all these are closed, yeah. resistance wise, it's still zero ohms. They're just controls, fuse, timer, or, I mean thermostats and stuff like that. But a timer motor usually has two or 3,000 ohms of resistance. So you'll hear that term path of least resistance. Electricity would rather go around that motor than try to force through the motor and this circuit. It'd just be like, there's a bully on the block. You're gonna walk around the next block so you don't see that bully, okay? But what happens is the dryer's heating and it's 155 degree thermostat. Thermostat opens up. And when that thermostat opens up, it's supposed to stop the heater. But now power goes through the timer. So when the thermostat's closed, it's running and heating, but once it gets to right temperature, the thermostat's gonna open to control the temperature, timer's advancing. But while that's happening, the heater's not really getting hot because this thing here is dropping the voltage to only like three or four volts at the heater, mm -hmm. okay? So that it, it's just a path now and not a, not a load, okay? So that the heater's not working now, so then what's happening to my temperature? My temperature's dropping, the thermostat closes again, timer stops, and now we get heat. So it's constantly turn the timer on, turn the heater off. Turn the timer on, turn the heater off. Back and forth like this. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, 
not this circuit, and we'll talk about it another day. I had a GE dryer. Customer was saying that on auto dry, her timer wasn't advancing, but in time dry, her dryer was advancing. This is late 80s, early 90s. I was working for Brandsmart at the time instead of Sears. And um, based on this, I said, oh, you need a timer. I'm gonna order you a timer because it works in time. I know the motor's good and everything. Got me a switch or something. I'm just gonna order you a timer. Well, it turned out the way the thermostats were set up, the operating thermostat is what sends power to the timer motor. It looked like this. I'm just gonna make it real quick. Here's your timer switch and say, here's your timer motor, etc. Your operating thermostat was here and then your high, high limit thermostat was here and then your, your heater, okay? Just like that. But this thermostat was single pole, double throw. Where'd you see that? We talked about it just a few minutes ago about the different type of thermostat, right? So it had another connection here that went like this. So that if I'm time dry, I close this and the timer motor advanced, 60 minutes later it shut off, or 30 minutes, whatever I said it. But if I open this up, the only way that timer would get power is if the operating thermostat cycled it. This is how GE did it. This isn't exactly how it's drawn, but it, it's the theory of it. Yeah. So what happened is the customer's vent on the roof of her house was blocked. So when the vent is blocked, we lose air circulation. The operating thermostat didn't receive the hot air, but the high limit was right next to the heater, so we didn't have enough airflow. It was cycling the heater on the high limit. Timer never advanced. It was just a problem. I put the timer in, it ran. I said, okay, ma'am, see you later, have a good day. I come back too late, she says, it's still not advancing. I'm like, what? And that's when I looked at the circuit and realized this auto dry has a different circuit. It didn't use that power resistor or use that circuit. It used the thermostat itself to send power, not thermostat opening and then it ran. GE so did it differently. So again, you have to look at the circuit, know how those parts work in the circuit. Any questions about that? No? So going back to our timer circuit here, in this case, if the operating thermostat didn't open, we'd still have a high limit thermostat. If neither one of them opened, the timer wouldn't advance. But if they were the problem, the customer wouldn't be calling you telling my timer to advance. What would the customer be telling you? No. Uh, eventually the customer would be telling you, my dryer's not running. Because the operating thermostat, which was down here controlling the heater, is 155. If it didn't open, my temperature's gonna keep going up. Mm. What's gonna happen? That thermal fuse in series with my motor is gonna fail. So I'm gonna go to the customer's house for a dryer not running instead of a timer not advancing. If one of my thermostats were the problem. Yeah. Okay? So I know it's a lot to take in. We're covering over a lot of things here, but let's... So, it, yes. you say it would, it, the complaint would be that the dryer is not running. Well, it, if the thermostats weren't cycling, like the operating's not gonna cycle if we have a vent problem, but the high limit will still cycle if we have a vent problem. Mm -hmm. So the timer would still advance. But if neither one of those thermostats failed, you say, well, that's why the timer is advancing. Yeah, but if those thermostats failed, the next thing that's gonna happen is the, the heat element's not gonna be controlled and we're gonna blow the thermal fuse and shut the dryer off altogether. So you'll probably never get like thermostat problems to fail to open in this case, even though that's what cycles it because there's other fail-safes inside the machine. I don't know if I can explain it any other than that, but if these thermostats didn't open, you wouldn't even be worried about this. You'd be worried about overheating. And overheating would be controlled by that thermal fuse or the thermal cutoff, depending on where our heating problem is. Any other questions on this one? Well, I know sometimes you look at, you don't think of the question right now, and then maybe 30 minutes from now, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Come back if you have any other questions, okay?
But so it the the um so the okay so the door switch is not even on that on that circuit. Well, the timer is not running through the door switch. Well, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And one of the reasons why they didn't run the timer through the door switch in this case, this timer is going to line two in both circuits. I think the okay. other one here. This one was also going to line two. So this was a 240 volt timer motor. Most of them are 110, 120. 120. Okay. But we don't want the timer in series with the door switch, even if it went to neutral. If you look at the dryers that have 120 volt timer motors, they don't go to the door switch. Why? Why? Because if the customer stops the dryer mid cycle or whatever, and opens up the door and takes the clothes out, she's gonna close the door all the way. The timer in the background is gonna keep running and finish this, the timer cycle and put it to the off position so that there's no switches in the timer closed when they're not using it. They want the timer to advance itself out because if you stop mid-cycle, open the door mid-cycle, the timer still has a path. Now even going on the time drive, you see the path. What about the auto drive? Does it still have a path? Well, we're saying, oh, but in that case, though, I, I gotta, let me, let me use black instead of yellow. It's a little bit harder to see that. Um, so I'll just, I'll just clean everything. So in, in the same circuit here, the timer switch for the heater, I had the thermal cutoff, I had the operating thermostat, I had the high limit thermostat, and it went to here. Would the timer still advance here in the off position and auto drive? The thermostats aren't going to be open, are they? Because the dryer is not running. Mm -hmm. So would the timer time out anyways? Yes. Why? You say yeah. Because he's going through because that circuit from the top. No, I, I, I'm here through, through this heater circuit. Yeah. I can't see what you mean. Centrifugal switch. When it's off, is the motor running? No. No. But on this side here, it takes this opening so that runs. But this would be open so the timer would run. But the motor's not on when the machine's off. Where in the other circuit, the timer, the, the, the centrifugal switch was here through the heater down here. So in that other circuit, it went through the centrifugal switch, needs the motor to run. But on this circuit, it didn't use that. So in time, it'll time out. In auto, it won't. On some of the dryers, they take this timer, put it through the heater, and they bypass the centrifugal switch, but very few of them do that. Okay, so it wouldn't time out because the motor's off. And if the motor's off, that switch won't close, so that, that circuit won't work. Okay. Now we have the heater circuit. How many controls do we have in series with the heater? Three. Three? Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. six. How close could you get to the heater without actually going to the heater? Not that close. Centrifugal switch, which is on the motors on the other side of the machine. But you could go right to the heater if you're in the back of the machine, because this is the back of the machine, this is back of the machine, this is back of the machine, and these are still technically in the back in the timer. The only thing that's not in the back is the centrifugal switch. So here's the thing on a 240 volt circuit. If this circuit's good, I'll have 240 volts here. Mm -hmm. No heat, and I have 240 there, what do we do? Change the heater, right? Yeah. A lot of people on a 240 volt circuit will say, well, what if I go to ground? with one of my meter leads. I need one meter lead here and I go here. How much voltage am I gonna have here? 120. How much am I gonna have here? Nothing. 120. I have 240, 120, 120 in ground, right? Mm -hmm. What if this switch was broken? 
From here to here, how much do I have? How much do I have here? Zero. 120. Why? Go ahead, Josh. What are you going to say? Go ahead, say it. Say it. You're getting electricity from another part of the machine. No, look. Or, you, or you're doing zero. It's going through the heater, but there's no amperage, so I still have 120. Even from here to ground, I have 120. And from here to ground, I have 120. I'm going to have 120 whether this, if this is open, I'm going to have 120 here because this is line one. Well, line two will come all the way to here. Even though this is open, here, I go from, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I hit the pen, yeah? I go from here and ground, I'll have 120 here, even though that thermostat's open. It's not a good test on a 240 volt circuit to use ground. But there is a way to use ground, even though I just told you don't use ground. Let's say the problem is my centrifugal switch, right? Well, all these here up to this point, these will close as soon as I turn the dial, time dry, auto dry, whatever. Mm -hmm. They're gonna complete the circuit to my element. Mm -hmm. If I don't press start, this switch won't run. So if I go here to ground, while the dryer's off, I can see if I have 120 there. If I have 120 at these two points, ground and there, what is that telling me? What kind of information is that telling me? That circuit, is okay. that circuit is what? Okay. It's good. That if I have 120 from here to ground, well, I'm not feeding back this way, right? Because the motor's not running. That switch is not allowing the other line to come in. So now I can check it with it off. And then if I wanted to see my heater was a problem, if I just took this meter lead off, and went from here to here, and I got zero volts. What does that mean? The heater's bad. The heater's broken, I have my one here. If the heater was good, the voltage would come to the other side and go to ground, and you say, yeah, but wouldn't that voltage drop? Voltage drop only occurs when electrical current is constantly flowing. And that happens when everything in the circuit closes. Here's an example. Is it doesn't the voltage drop when you are Two loads on the same on the same circuit as well? Well, if you have two loads in series, yes, you have a voltage drop between the two loads. But voltage is like electrical pressure, like water pressure. All right? So if I go to a hose with a with a spray gun on it, turn on the hose on the wall, I can shoot water all day. I'm watering my plants, hosing off my driveway. Now if I turn the hose off on the wall, and I pull the trigger, what will happen? For a second or so, it'll shoot out until the pressure drops. Okay, so if I don't have current constantly flow, it wouldn't drop. So I could have that hose laying on the ground and the hose could be partially kinked. When the hose is off on the wall, I could pull the trigger. I'm gonna have full pressure coming out only for a few seconds till it drops. So when we're doing with the machine off, I can check anywhere here to ground with it off, knowing that L2 is not coming in, so anything I'm reading is the L1 side. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't like using ground. I'm gonna go to this, and I wanna see the machine running to see if I got 240 here. But if I have zero volts, you're, you're on the back of the machine. So you would go to either side of the heating Right here, I'm going to put two, both meter leads points. there and I'm going to look for 240. Right. But what if you go to a customer's house, right? And no heat. You checked your three screws. 120, 120, 240. That means that's good. Power cord, this is line one here. This is line two here. I know I got proper power to the machine. Remember, we do that test before we take it apart. Right? So I'm going to go right to the heater and see if I got voltage to the heater. Let's just say I don't have 240 there. What's the next test? The next test on the left side. So you go from one side over here. Wait, no, no, no power at the 
Your meter says zero volts. Now, most likely, one of these components are bad. It could be a centrifugal switch, high limit, operating, thermal cutoff, or timer switches, right? Could be any one of them. My meter is going to say zero. Does that mean there's actually zero volts there? No, because if this is my problem, line one won't be here, but L2 would. Remember, this test is done when the machine is running, right? So that switch will close. So my meter will say zero, but I because it doesn't have both. All right? But I'm looking for voltage. Well, then you could say, well, it's any one of those parts you just highlighted, Z. That's that's our problem. Okay, but where do we begin testing? I can go to centrifugal switch. Well, I got to take the whole drum out and check it, right? Right. Or I can check the thermostats, and if the, the thermostats and the fuses, they're all right next to the heater. But if they're all good, then I got the timer, and I got to take another panel off. Mm -hmm. So before I start taking panels off, what tests can I make to make my life easier? There's two tests you're going to make right here to tell you which side of the circuit of the heater your problem is at. So you go from L1 to one side of the heater. Right. So you take one side off the heater yeah. and you move that meter lead to here. Yeah. If all of a sudden I have 240, then I know something here is my problem, not allowing this line to come down. So whatever side I have the voltage on, now I know. I don't have to check the centrifugal switch because my problem's over here because I have 240. That means this has to be all the way to here. But here it didn't make it, but here and here it made it. So now it has to be here. So you know what I would do just to save myself even more time? So I got 240 there. I'm gonna take this one, and since I'm on the back of the machine, I'm gonna go here to my thermal cutoff. And if I have 240 between these two points, well then I know my timer is good, right? Yeah. Now I know it's right here. Mm -hmm. So again, the point is knowing your circuit, knowing where you're putting your meters and what readings you're getting to know which way to go to find your problem. So then if you go from the heating element to, from the back there to the operating thermostat and that's still 240, then that's good. So it's well, not I'll have 240 here, but if that's my problem, then what? Here it would is, be yeah, zero. That would be zero. Right. So, what, what I always say is we go here and we, we backtrack till we find voltage. And if I don't have voltage here and I have voltage here, that's what my problem is. But when you first go and you got multiple switches and there are different parts of the machine all over the machine, go back to the power source and try to determine which side did I lose the voltage on. That's the side I'm going to go look. It's like, uh, go back to that story where I tell you to go to the store or something. If I told you to go to the store to pick something up and you made four stops before you got to the store and then you drove back here and then you're like, oh man, I, I don't have the change. I lost the change or whatever. Would I go to like the second or third stop and then say, well, which way do I go? Do I go back to the way this way or that way where I lost that money? We don't start in the middle. We have to start at one point and go back and find out which side did I lose it on. And going back to, well, if I was looking for the change, I know I had it when I went to the store, and they were the ones that gave me the change, so that's the only place I'm going to look. So when you're doing these circuits, we've got to try to break down sides and loads and, and, and know all these controls, where they are in the machine, and if any of them fail, what could the problem be? So tomorrow, any questions on this before we talk about tomorrow's assignment? Yes, sir. Okay, I got two questions. You talked about how the buzzer kicks in. Oh, I. And, um, yes, sir. I said, you know what? The buzzer circuit. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead, ask your question. Oh, I was just going to say, if you could explain it again, how does that kick in? I, I forgot. Yeah. I, had, I had it on the screen and I, <laughs> that didn't go over it. Okay, so here's what happens when a dryer is running, this centrifugal switch here is going to close to this position. So power is going to come in here and go like this, feed the motor, go through the one winding and go out. But since this centrifugal switch is here, this circuit is here. 
And they're saying, when does the buzzer operate? When, when do when we the hear the buzzer? At the end, end of the cycle. Right. But isn't there a circuit right here for the buzzer right now? If, if I go through here and go up this way, so why isn't the buzzer buzzing right now? Because if we go 5M this way, so where they both meet, at this point, I just have a switch, zero ohms. A buzzer, like the timer motor, is only is like two or 3,000 ohms. So that power has two paths. These two are actually parallel to each other. If we were to draw that in, in more of a straight line, which is, I'm just gonna do the motor part here, three, five, six, okay? And I'm gonna do this. The buzzer is here, but there's also a timer switch here. And they both go out. So power's gonna go through a timer switch and go through a buzzer. But if I open this timer switch, power goes through the buzzer. So what happens here at the last few seconds of the cycle, this timer switch will open before that timer switch opens. That'll open like a minute before the cycle is to terminate. And when that happens, this motor is now forced to go this way through the buzzer, but it has very high resistance. So there's not enough power here for the motor to keep going. So the, just like that uh, timer in auto drive, where we put it in series with the heater, now the motor only has three ohms. So it becomes a path for the buzzer. But the buzzer takes so much power, the motor cannot continue to run because the buzzer's stealing all the power. So the motor dies because of the resistance value of that buzzer and the cycle terminates. And then within a few seconds on time drive, what happens? The timer just times it out. So it's not because there's any timer in the buzzer, it's just the time between when the two time switches open and the draw on the buzzer. Not this one, because if this one opened, nothing would have power. Right. But if we went back to that dryer book, we, I think I had that dryer book open, that you, when you guys practiced when you first started on the um, on diagrams, this, this same circuit here, it's a little bit easier to see the buzzer circuit here. So power would go this way, and then when the motor is running, it'd be here, 5, 5M five and 4M, and the motor would run. He'd say, yeah, with the buzzer here, but the power's gonna go through this, power's gonna go through this switch instead of going through that buzzer. But once YBG opens, power goes through the buzzer and the motor, but now the motor slows down because that robs all the power, and then the buzzer stops. It's a little bit easier to see the circuit and on that basic electricity book, the dryer, which was the second circuit that you started working on, the washer was the first one, it did show you that buzzer circuit and like if you highlighted it when it wasn't supposed to be highlighted, that's what was happening. So did that explain it? You said you had two questions? Yeah, this, yeah, this, is, this dryer has a guard switch. Is that for the motor or some kind of... Let's something? Let's go back to the other circuit. Um, is that the motor guard or is this a frame? The guard switch um, is a circuit for the motor, like it's called wrinkle guard. Okay. And what happens is if you chose that selection, a lot of times this timer switch won't open and this will stay closed because of the relay coil. And then this switch would close and the motor would run for like a minute or two and then stop and like for five minutes, it won't do anything. But then after a couple of minutes, it starts tumbling again. And the reason is at the end of the cycle, if the clothes have sit there too long, will start to gather wrinkles. So that the wrinkle guard would every few minutes tumble the dryer for a little bit, trying to fluff up the clothes to try to reduce wrinkles. Let's say the customer went grocery shopping and didn't get a chance to take the clothes out right away. So when they came home, there was very little wrinkles in the clothes, and that is the purpose of the wrinkle guard switch. Yes, sir. Can you turn the arrow? 
Uh, <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> but if I turn it up, if I turn it on when I lecture, 